were born in Jacksonville, Florida, right? December 2nd, 1948. How was, how was it different from today's Jacksonville, Florida? Oh my Florida? gosh. Uh, <laughs> I could go on forever about that. I mean, it's... Go, go over about it. I mean, because uh, uh, Patricia told me that you come from a huge family, right? Yeah, I, I had 10 brothers and sisters. Wow. Yeah, well, wow. Well, and it ain't cheaper by the dozen, believe me. <laughs> yeah. So how was it growing up in Florida? Tell me. I, it was in Jacksonville. Of course, there was not near as many people. Of course, of, you know back then, you know, and the uh, ratio, uh, ethnic mix was, you know, different. A, a lot different. Yeah, <laughs> a lot different, and uh, things were different. And it, you know, you grow up like that, you know, and um, and when you're growing up. Your brain is a computer. It registers and it logs in everything. Yeah, you know, and you know you you turn your brain into like a a, a history box, you know. And it's kind of hard at an older age, you know. You see history as history, and the new stuff is difficult to try to deal with, mm -hmm. especially nowadays. Wow. <laughs> but Jacksonville was a, a, a small. We're a small family, you know, and um, on Mole Street. We lived on Mall Street, and mm -hmm. Ron, the Van Zandt family lived on Mall Street, about six houses up from where we lived at. We stayed there for years and years and years, and then we moved back, actually up under the Matthews Bridge mm -hmm. uh, in the late 50s. Stayed there till around 60. And uh, then we moved back to the west side, and we moved one street over from Mall, where Ronnie and the Van Zants lived, mm -hmm. to Pangola Drive. So we went from six houses this away to about six houses this away, same distance from where the Van Zant household was. Now, that sounds like a lot of moving to me, but okay. So basically, you and Ronnie knew each other since you were kids, right? Little kids, yeah. Do you remember the moment when you met him? Pro probably not the moment. We were just little kids. Yeah, just know? like, you know, playing in the same neighborhood or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's on the same street as little kids, you know. I mean, playing, you know, little little games. Mm -hmm. Stick ball, you know, run back and forth, and got a, a plastic bat playing blue ball with a plastic ball, and just growing up as kids, elementary school, you know, growing up, you know. So you went to school together. We did. Okay. But then, the early '60s, when they consolidated the city mm -hmm. and turned the city, the county, into the city, and made the whole county the city of Jacksonville. When they did that, that changed boundary lines. And on Woodcrest, Ronnie lived on Woodcrest mm -hmm. and, and, and Mall Street. And we lived on Pangola Drive, the next street over. So we lived south of Woodcrest, and Ronnie lived north of Woodcrest. So if, if you lived north of Woodcrest, that changed the boundaries. They sent you to Ramona Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Hyde Park and then Lake Shore Junior High. I didn't get to high school. I know oh. uh, I made it to ninth grade and that was it. Okay, I yeah. see. And then, uh, did you guys play any sports together? Anything not, not together. Okay. We played baseball okay. on different baseball teams for mm -hmm. the City League. He and Gary Rosington played. Mm -hmm. Ronnie and Gary Mock Sox and Green Pigs. And I played for a team called the Optimist. <laughs> and, um, that would, we, we didn't do that for a, a long time because I don't think it, the, the league stayed together forever. And he, at, Lake, at, at Lehigh School, he um, tried out for the uh, football team. Mm -hmm. And I think he actually made the team, but from scrimmage, the first, first practice, he broke his ankle. Oh my goodness. First, I mean, the very, very first play from scrimmage. <laughs> And then that, that was a sign. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't do that. And they had to put a couple. <laughs> when you do music, don't do that. A <laughs> couple of pins in it, and then that made him 4F, <laughs> so he couldn't be drafted. Okay. Because he had pins in his ankle. Wow. So That's... he was denied being drafted in the army, which and, and then I was I was drafted in 1969, working alongside him at his brother-in-law's auto parts store, 19, <laughs> May of 1969. Uh huh. We were working together. He was the manager, and I was delivering parts. 
That's and awesome. And that I got sounds drafted. Fun. And then uh, you also went to the fishing trips together. Am I oh, we fished. We fished a lot. As what was the biggest fish that you ever caught? Well, we fished for black bass, a largemouth bass, mm -hmm. uh, and um, the biggest one he caught was. Um, 11 pound 8 ounces. Oh, wow. That's a big one. That's you know, he always wanted a big bass and went an old truck. He said, before he died. Mm -hmm. And so, fortunately, he got the, the old Chevrolet truck, 55 Chevy truck, mm -hmm. a couple of months before he died. Mm -hmm. And in May of 77, we went fishing and he caught the 11 pound 8 ounce bass. And I was with him and throwed it in the boat, you know, and we jumped around and had a hell of a good time. It was the best day of his life. So he, awesome. he got the two things he really wanted. He wanted an old truck before he died and a trophy of bass. <laughs> he mounted the bass, had it mounted, and got the bass back just before he passed away. <sighs> yeah. So coming back to the music, like, have you ever, like, would you, imagine that at any part of Ronnie's time he would become a musician like was he interested in music no no as <laughs> early on way back then um, as boys love football sports boxing he loved boxing mm -hmm. and back then Muhammad Ali was called Cassius Clay and his boxing matches he was Cassius Clay and Ronnie loved him and so Ronnie, then he got spunky and, and, and Lacey got him a pair of gloves. Mm -hmm. So Ronnie wanted to be a boxer. He was going to box. Mm -hmm. And so he started you know, sporting around, boxing around. So there was a guy in the neighborhood named Estes Godwin, mm -hmm. short, stocky guy, older than us, a few years, a couple years or whatever. <laughs> but, so but, he wanted to beat him up or something? But Estes was tough. So Estes put the gloves on. Ronnie wanted to box Estes, you know. So. Right, right. It's just beat the tar out of him. <laughs> so that changed Savage. his mind right then about being a boxer because it was he got embarrassed because it's just just beat the tar out of him. <laughs> so then football. He loved football. Loved the Green Bay Packers. He loved them. So he wanted to play. He was at Lake. He was at um, Lee High School, and he wanted to play football. Mm -hmm. You know. So then he got his ankle broke. And so that there went his football career. He couldn't play football no more. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't go with him, but it was Jim Daniels and Bill Fairs and him, er, 60s, early, 64, maybe 65, somewhere around there, the Rolling Stones came to the Gator Bowl. And so he went to watch the Stones. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you've seen back, back then, Mick Jagger used to dance and shuffle his feet. He always dances. Yeah. he never stops even now. No, I mean now, but back then he, he'd shuffle side to side with his feet. So Ronnie came like, back. Like move like Jagger, you know. Yeah, and Ronnie came back doing that. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be a singer. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Be, and so that was it. Well, he was successful in that. Let me that tell you. That was his calling. I, mean, I, I'm kind of inspired by him because he was trying many things in my, in his life and trying to, you know, fit everything on him and trying to see if he's gonna do that for the rest of his life I mean that's pretty amazing but 1964 is basically the official birth of Leonard Skinner well first of all where did the name came from what's up with the name well when they when they first put the musicians together which would have been Ronnie Gary Larry Johnstrom Bob Burns mm -hmm. and Alan Collins mm -hmm. Uh, Ronnie decided he's gonna put a band together, and so um, Larry Justrom went to Lee, and so it was no problem. Larry wanted to be the bass player, and he's got with Gary Rosington, and so Gary they got Larry Justrom. So then they needed a drummer who was playing ball, and Ronnie got up to bat, and Bob Burns was on third base. I don't think he was playing third. He was on third base. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie hit a line driving and hit Bob in the, right in the Lord in the shoulder, Ouch. knocked the tar out of him. And Bob fell down moaning. Ronnie rode over, runs over him. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You know, you didn't mean it. So, you know, and he said, you're Bob Burns. You play drums. 
And I knew Bob since we were kids. Me and Bob would go back to the 50s. And he said, yeah, I play drums. I said, yeah, Bob, yeah, he played. And so Ronnie says, we need a drummer. You come on and be in the band with us. So then they got Bob Burns in the band. They had, and they didn't have Alan Collins, because mm -hmm. a few days before, Alan was playing in a band called the Mods, J.R. Rice's band. Mm -hmm. Alan heard that Ronnie would want him to come be in the band. Mm -hmm. Alan was scared and said, Ronnie, maybe Ryan and Gary saw him the day before, but Alan saw them and throw his bicycle down and he ran. Yeah, I've heard the story. I'm like. And he ran and they, they couldn't catch him. <laughs> so the next day I was going home from work or something, whatever I was doing, piddling around, whatever. And they, they were at JR's house, they were playing ball. And I passed by there and Alan was on the mound pitching. And I went to Ronnie's house and I said, hey man, I said, they're playing ball at JR's, Allen's on the mound pitching. Let's go get it, right? Come on. So we jumped in this Mustang and we took off and just slid up there and jumped out of the car and ran to the mound and we just grabbed Allen kidnapped him <laughs> and we said he's coming to play him with us and we'll be back later to get his amplifier and his guitar mm -hmm. and so Ronnie and Alan came back later and so the other the guys they didn't want to mess with me and Ronnie <laughs> so Alan became a part of the band and Bob Burns lived right down the street from where he got hit with the baseball and that was a carport and that Alicia and Hyde Hyde Grove, Hyde Park, Hyde Park, and Alicia is where Bob Burns lived. Mm -hmm. And they started the first strumming of the guitars in Bob Burns' carport, 64-ish. That's amazing. Yeah. And um, there is a rumor that says that the band had nicknames, like each of the members of the, uh, of the band. And I was just wondering why Ronnie was called uh, Papa Ronnie? Oh, you said a nickname? Yeah. Well, they had several names before they called themselves Leonard Skinner. Mm -hmm. I think first they were called My Backyard. <laughs> That's actually a pretty good name. Yeah. And then in the um, tequila, I like real tequila them. bottle, there's a worm in there. Uh -huh. uh, and so they call themselves Conquer the Worm <laughs> to drink tequila. That was the second brief name. Uh, and then... Um, the pretty ones, and then the one percent, because they figured they had less than one percent chance of making it. Mm -hmm. And then from the one percent, they went to the name Leonard Skinner. Now, if I understand this correctly, Leonard Skinner is the name uh, was named after some of the professors at school, some of the a, a gym coach. Well, he actually taught gym, and I think he taught history, also. But Leonard Skinner, the coach, yeah, and they were they would be out there at the Hale House drinking the smoking pot whatever you know <laughs> the phone would ring bob burns was funny and bob burns was comical so the phone would ring mm -hmm. and bob would pick the phone up they, they said who is it he goes leonard skinner leonard skinner because he, he got on gary's ass bad and larry johnstrom about their hair the long hair and so what's wrong with the long hair i mean isn't that awesome like well nowadays but back then it wasn't you had to have your hair two inches above your collar no bangs you had to wear socks. You had to wear your shirt tail in. That was. I wouldn't. Sir. I would be probably as rapeless as as they are. Be like. But that was school policy, oh. and Leonard was hardcore. He made him <laughs> abide by school policy. He was measuring, you know. Yeah, Gary didn't. He made Gary wear a hairpiece, trim his hair, and Ronnie <laughs> left Lee. He got Nadine, his girlfriend, pregnant, so he left about the same time that Coach Leonard Skinner came there. Mm -hmm. So Ronnie missed Coach Skinner's action, mm -hmm. and it was all dedicated to Gary. A little bit Larry Johnson, but not much Larry, because Larry was, Larry was obedient, and Larry was not, I don't know the right words to say, Larry wasn't. Um, not savage, basically. He wasn't like he wasn't protesting all of it. He wasn't flashy. There was no flash. <laughs> like, he lived like me. Larry Johnson was cool as he could be. But they were talking about changing the name mm -hmm. from the one percent mm -hmm. and they were looking for a name and a song came on the radio about that time called camp granada you remember leonard skinner he got tomate poisoning last night after dinner <laughs> that's a lyric in the song and they heard it and they went 
well, it's Leonard Skinner, you know, and so they already were debating about his name, changing it around, and so that's how the name came about. Bob Burns, you know, that's great. and uh, so and they changed the spelling of it to aggravate Leonard so it wouldn't be his name because he, he was such, he was a redneck. Oh, <laughs> Leonard Skinner was a redneck and uh, he was a big, big, big time FSU alumni. Mm -hmm. He could go to football games in Tallahassee, but he couldn't go to football games in Gainesville because he got in a fight with them, with them Gators. <laughs> and uh, so they had it, he couldn't go. He's looking down. He was a he was a tough guy too. Leonard Skinner was a tough guy, but that's how they got the name. That's great. Uh, and how did you become like a security manager for them? I never drank, never done no drugs, nothing like that. And several guys uh, uh, challenged me, and they they didn't. They got <laughs> their tune got changed. Denied. Yeah, they, and especially three at one time from the off the bus jumped on me three at one time, and wow. uh, that, 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 I took care of them pretty quick. And so, what happened? How I got into that was, um, was 1975, and Leonard Skinner, Ronnie's management, was the same management for the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. They shared the same office, and. Actually, I think he was the Stones at that time, tour manager, mm -hmm. but the management of the Stones. Mm -hmm. And so they were having some trouble with the Hells Angels. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this. So they had a couple of people that they couldn't trust working for the Stones. Ronnie says, I got a buddy of mine. I'll call him, come up here, and he'll take care of this problem. I still didn't know nothing about the, the Angels. Mm -hmm. you know? So. Uh, Ronnie calls me, he said, hey, bring your pistol, come on to New York. Oh, wow. I said, why? I said, yeah. He said, just do what I tell you. Bring it, the Stones need a bodyguard, and you're the man. So I come up there, still not knowing anything about the angels. We get into the, uh, the office, you know, and he went, mm -hmm. um, he says, okay. He says, um, uh, Mario will be here. A little while to pick us up. Mm -hmm. uh, go out to dinner. I said, "Okay." I said, uh, "Who's Mario?" Mario is the president of the East Coast chapter of the Hell's Angels in 1975. And if I'm not mistaken, the Hell's Angels are basically the biker group. Yeah, right. Okay. And he's coming to pick us up to take us to dinner. Mm -hmm. And he says. Uh, they're having some trouble with the Hells Angels. And I went, that's what you brought me up here for? To have, I said, I'm not gonna mess with the Hells Angels. I said, there ain't no way. I've got friends in those organizations. He said, Duh. I said, I no. I said, get me a ticket. Make sure I get to the airport. I'm, I'm out of here. I said, I'm, I'm going to, he said, hold it, Gene, hold it, man, hold on. I said, ah, oh, man, I ain't messing with the hell's angels. What's wrong with you? I said, this, this, I said, I don't want nothing to do with this, period. Just make sure I got an airplane ticket when I get to the airport. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm grabbed the door. Oh, no. He said, hey, hold it, man, hold it, man, hold it. Hold on a minute. He reached in the drawer and he pulled out a book, you know, and he picked it, he picked it, and he picked it, and he said, he's here. Okay. He said, he's on the way to pick us up. I said, man, I don't know. He said, listen, Gene, just listen to me. Mm -hmm. He says, listen to what he's got to say first. And uh, I said, all right. So we, we, he didn't come on a motorcycle. He came on a big old limousine. We got in the back of the limousine, you know, and he introduced himself and myself. You know, I said, hey, man, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not going to do it. He said, don't worry, buddy. He said, what we got going on with the stones, it all reflected back to Altamont, Mm -hmm. where the person got killed and the angels got arrested doing security for the stones. That's what that was. And I said, man, I look here, buddy. I don't have no problem with you people or nothing. He said, don't worry about it. He said, you just do your job. He said, you're not going to interfere with anything and we're not going to do anything. Yeah. He said, you got my word. I said, well, because I don't want any problem with you people. He said, you won't. He said, you just do your job. Me and Ronnie are buddies. He says, and you'll be my buddy too. I said, all right, no problem. And so uh, we, uh, I had two other security guys 
Stones did monsters, big old monster guys. And um, so uh, as we were getting back in the car, I had to, had to have supper. We were talking, Mario, we were talking, he's laughing, we were talking, and he said, hey, we might try you out. And I went, I, I, I don't, I told, he said, don't worry about nothing, everything's cool, you're cool with us. I said, all right. So we went to a private party and I had outside where, um, I got those two goons with me. And uh, I don't want to call him a wannabe, but he was one of the, before you can become to wear colors, mm -hmm. you have to do things for the for the for the organization. Okay. And this guy walked up there, cut off Levi jacket, no colors, no not no nothing, just gonna push right by and go into the party. I said, "This is a private party, buddy." He said, ah, "I'm coming in," and I said, "You two guys were monsters." I said, "Is he coming in?" He said, "No." He picked that guy up by that coat and just threw that guy, and he just kept on going. So he knew then that we meant business. So I didn't have any problem with him, and the, um, we spoke a couple times after that. And but the problem was that the Stones had with the Hell's Angels was between the Stones and the Hell's Angels. Gene Odom was not involved in none of that stuff. Period. And that's how. Uh, so Ronnie told me. We, we're gonna be making the big money here shortly, so I want you to be my bodyguard and, and take care of us. And um, so in 76, I was laid off. He called me up, we went fishing, just helped me come back in and he says, hey, he says, uh, I told you I want you to work for me. Mm -hmm. I said, man, I'm not so sure I wanna do that. And I said, you know, I'm iron working, I make pretty good money. And I said, I got a retirement package. You bands break up all the time. I'm just, you know, I don't think I really want to get involved. And I said, oh, oh man, I'm, I really do. He says, get, matter of fact, get your passport. We're going to Europe. You're on the payroll. I said, man, I can't go right now because I have a lawsuit oh. with, the, with the union and the contractor. Mm -hmm. And I have to be in, in, in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, all right. Well, he says, uh, you're on the payroll. Uh, uh, we're going to Europe. So when they came back, and uh, I said, man, I'm not sure I want to do this. I said, because, you know, I'm telling you, I don't, you musicians just don't. Yeah, you're very said, realistic, basically. Yeah, he says, uh, no, right man, now. he said, I'm, he said, you take care of me. You're the only person I, I know that'll never drink, never do drugs. Mm -hmm. He said, you'll take care of us, and you'll get us off of the stuff that we're on, and you'll do it right. You're the only person that can do that. You were basically like babysitting them, right? Ba baby, babysitting, basically. <laughs> uh, yeah, a bunch of drugaholics. <laughs> and so, uh, when we when, when we went on tour, mm -hmm. um, I was getting paid, and I got my check, and I went, "Oh no, 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 no! I'm not working for this." <laughs> I said, "I make twice that much money working." He went, "Well, they, you know, they don't really want you to be in the band because they don't trust you." You know, they don't, because you're my friend. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, because, and you'll be watching them too, and you'll be in there. So he says, um, he, we got per diem. We got $20 a day per diem. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm going to give you my per diem, and you take your per diem and put those two together with your check. And he said, that's, that, that's what you'll make iron working. And you are all expense paid. Every receipt, everything you do, you bring it to me, mm -hmm. and I cover everything. And you're all expense paid, so your salary is 100%. So I went to that work for him. That's amazing. You know? And you mentioned that you worked for Rolling Stones as well? On the Tour of the Americas. Briefly. Was it uh, 1975, right? 75, Tour of the yes. Americas. So. Now, they did ask me in 78. They contacted me. To basically actually, come back. Yeah, and they gave, they, they in Kissimmee, Florida, they actually invited me down and had a big suite for me and everything. And mm -hmm. they say, I said, I, you know, because I had been in the plane crash and I lost my eye and I was still going through surgeries. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can't, I can't work right now. I said, I, 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 but the eye messed up and working with it and, you know, all the surgeries. And right now I'm just not so. We, we had a good conversation. We talked, and it's, I, I went to the show and come back and you know, had spent, stayed in the suite. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, well, we'll we're going to do this again down the road. And so I went to see him uh, years later. 
they came into town and I went to see them and um, we talked and I told them I just was didn't want to do that anymore you know I see and then how many other stars did you meet along while you were like touring with Skinners and Rolling Stones stars yeah um, uh, I met a lot of people I, I wouldn't call them stars musicians yeah. you know it, a couple of stars I thought they were stars you remember the old guy that did the Vern things Vern uh -huh. the comedy act Skinner was when they re, when they regrouped for the tribute tour Charlie Daniels show uh -huh. the jam was the first show that they were going to do for the tribute tour and they were out there for like a week rehearsing to get the sound and everything down right. <laughs> and it was the night of the show, and Charlie Daniels' band was going to there was other people. And this Vern guy was coming down the hall with five or six women under his arms, you know, and <laughs> he was on TV and he was, you know, that was his heyday, you know. And so as he's walking toward me, I went, as they got cook, I said, "Whose wallet is that?" And they all went, and, he, and I just kept walking. And he said, "You're a funny guy." I said, "Yeah, I'm the original funny Vern." <laughs> and they, were, they were looking for that wallet. He's like, "That's that's good that you put." It embarrassed the hell out of me for his friends. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I put him in his place. I mean, and were you able to witness some of the basically births of the albums of Leonard Skinner? Were you like present in the studio when they were creating music? Um, not so much the studio as the Hell House, mm -hmm. and even before the Hell House and Mandarin and other and, and other places when they <laughs> when they couldn't play and they're trying to find themselves. Yeah, and then f the, st the studio album Street Survivors. I was in the studio mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta, and I wasn't doing nothing. I was just doing this, you know, you know, just in a couple around. of days. And they do it, and I don't like to hear music repetitively played over and over. My if you're going to do that, play Hank Williams or Lefty Frizzell for me. And so I, um, Steve Gaines, Alan and Gary were sitting on the couch. I'm the um, board and stuff behind me. Mm -hmm. So Steve Gaines goes in to, in to do a solo, you know, and everything. And so he's playing in there, you know. And I told Ronnie, I said, man, I'm not doing anything. I said, let me go home, find something to do. He said, all right. He said, go home and haul dirt out there and fill up the holes in my driveway, around my driveway and everything. And just get everything. I said, all right. So, um, I stand up and Alan Gary and Steve's in there playing. And I went, that guy is going to teach y'all something. Man, man. I said, I'm telling you, that guy right there mm -hmm. is going to make y'all tighten up. And so I, I left. Mm -hmm. And he's, for that album, Steve Gaines did make them boys tighten up. Mm -hmm. He put a spark in that. Ryan told me, ooh, I think it was a, as I was leaving, Ronnie said, Steve Gaines, he said, that's the best thing that ever happened to this band. And he was right. That's amazing. Yeah. And then, uh, what's your favorite song by Leonard, Leonard Skinner? Favorite song? Yeah. Uh, the Ballad of Curtis Lowe. What's the song about? Why do you like it so much? Uh, a verse, the lyrics in there says, I used to wake the morning before the rooster crowed, searching for soda bottles to get myself some dough. I know for a fact that line is written about me picking up Coke bottles in those ditches. Mm -hmm. The Van Zants didn't pick up no bottles. Mr. Rosington didn't pick up no bottles. Those other guys didn't. Um, and I like to tell the story because Lacey had got rear-ended in his semi and had gotten some money. I don't know how much, no, 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 that, but his own disability and all this other stuff. Yeah. And they had a little money. And back then, a little money was a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know. And so the Van Zants were too good to take the Coke bottles to the store to cash in those bottles. Not me. I get in there and pick up, you know, two, put five bottles, one, two, three, four, five, ten bottles. That's 
20 cent. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a moon pie and a co- RC Cola. And so uh, the Van Zants had wash tubs behind their house, big old number three wash tubs, full of bottles. Mm-hmm. They'd go buy cold drinks, put the bottles in those buckets out in the back, the wash tubs out back. They wouldn't take them to the store. I couldn't find any bottles. I'd just go in the Van Zants backyard and load up on the Van Zants bottles and take them to the store. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's my favorite song because I, I know that what that lyric's about. Yeah, it brings lots of memories and mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. Now, um, 1977, the Street Survivors tour. How did you feel about that? Well, I, I guess you could say I felt great about it because the album was so good, mm-hmm. and they they were getting to the top. That that album and at the point at that point in time they were known as the american beatles and i'll tell you another little secret the rolling stones held the record for madison square garden mm-hmm. sellouts for five consecutive nights mm-hmm. fall tour 1977 the leonard skinner band had madison's garden sold out for seven consecutive nights they would have beat the Stones record if the plane hadn't crashed. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were pretty, uh, they still amazing. Oh. I, I am recently, to my shame, I am recently discovered their music. Well, I knew about Sweet Home Alabama. Everybody knows about it. But like, I didn't know who was singing it, but then I discovered this album here. And for example, Sons is Simple Man and Free Bird just definitely straight to my heart you know I just always feel like Ronnie speaks to me directly he, he doesn't like speaks to everybody he speaks to me he's speaking directly to you I mean that's great lyrics music oh, fantastic anyway somewhere on the internet I read that Aerosmith were the one who's supposed to have a plane the Aerosmith deal was I find this out after the plane crash when I'm doing my own investigation mm-hmm. and everything. The road manager was part of the management, and they were gone. Believe me, they were at that uh, after that tour was over. That whole bunch was being fired, gone, because mm-hmm. they were stealing the band's money. And I, had, I proved it to Ronnie. I had to show him. So. Um, the road manager talked this company in Texas into getting that plane to fly people. Mm-hmm. But Falcon Airways, they didn't have a license to fly people. They had license to haul freight. They were a freight hauling outfit. So they established on paper a bogus corporation, uh, L&J Leasing, and got licensed to haul people mm-hmm. for commercial. And so um, I find out later, and in his book, he called it, he was getting a commission from those uh, airplane people to keep the band on the plane. He was making money for his own pocket, keeping the band on the plane. And so um, it was an old, old plane, but it was in relatively good shape, uh, you know, not being a mechanic or anything like that. But, Structurally and everything, until it's we start having those problems, <clears throat> and there's no way that band should have been on that plane anyway. But for somebody to make money on you know under the table, you know, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> they um, the night before when we left Lakeland. We knew there was a problem with it because we were flying. You could hear the engine, right engine, missing. It would be like, uh, uh, uh. you could, and not not being a, a pilot or a mechanic, you still know that something's not right. Wrong, yeah. And that scared us from people. And so, in Lakeland, when we left Lakeland, we were leaving the tarmac, and I find out later that they had um, were running that engine in what's called auto rich position meaning they were burning extra fuel into that engine to give it better performance mm-hmm. and they had the fuel mixture messed up and so when we took off under full power that engine just backfired blowed a ball of 
blue bowl of fire out of the back of that engine for me or to, your, to your daddy. Boom! You know, and we were like this. And they were getting up with the plane. And so I pulled myself up to the cockpit. I said, turn the plane around. Something happened to that engine. You've got an engine problem. There's a big ball of fire came out. So mm -hmm. they're struggling to get the plane up, you know, what pilots would be doing, fighting. Um, the pressure. Getting the, pressure. getting the plane up off the ground in the air, you know. And they would tell me to go sit down. You know, everything's fine. There's nothing wrong. And I said, turn the plane around. You know, I said, I seen the ball of fire come out. Of and so they're saying, to take charge. Um, go sit down. There's nothing wrong with that engine. Everything's fine. We're good. And so I went back to my seat. And when we got up, I went back up there. And I said, hey, I said, man, something's wrong with that engine. You don't need to turn this plane around. And the pilot said, no, we don't. Everything's fine. The gauges, he said, everything's fine. You know, we, wasn't, we know what we're doing. Ah, boy. So anyway, um, that was the first time that then the people started talking. And so probably amongst themselves on the plane, not so much. And then when we landed mm -hmm. in Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, they were backstage, uh, dressing room, talk, whatever, unbeknown to me because I was doing my job. So um, when the show was over in Greenville, South Carolina, they... I, I had cut down on 85% of the booze. And so they they had a few drinks or whatever, and then when they came back, they had stuff in the room. And so I don't know what kind of drugs they were doing. Got a good idea that what was going on. So they were having a band meeting the night before we left. And so when they were doing that, I would be sleeping. Mm -hmm. And I know Ronnie Van Zandt said, don't wake Gene up, don't wake him up for nothing, I let him sleep. So um, that's in that meeting is where they were having just discussions about the plane, not wanting to fly on the plane. The two girls, we had fired, jo we, the band had fired JoJo. She wasn't there, she had been fired. Mm -hmm. And so the two girls, and there was Billy and Dean, a couple more wanted to fly a commercial. They didn't want to fly on the plane. They were scared of it. I and, wouldn't want to fly on the oh, plane. Oh, bingo. Uh, and so um, they were talking about the album and in the room partying and drinking and doing it. And so nobody don't know this, but we had an alias. I didn't have to have an alias because I wasn't a star, but the band members they had alias names mm -hmm. for, for the rooms instead of the room being under Alan Collins or Gary Rosington. Gary had a Robert E. Lee was his alias, R. E. Lee. Jojo knew the aliases. Mm -hmm. So she called the rooms till she found the room that they were in. And she's crying on the phone right on you know, and, and, and Alan and Ronnie and talking, trying to get her job back. And they're running, they're, they're smoking, joking, drinking, too, whatever they're doing. And so Ronnie gets aggravated that she keeps calling. Tells Alan Collins, she said, this is your problem, boy. You better get this problem straightened out. Mm -hmm. And I mean it. And he had Alan squatted down in the corner. Uh, and so um, they were actually having a heated discussion, some of them not wanting to fly. And so they'd been up all night and Ronnie was aggravated. He didn't even come to the room. I got him going to the airport. The limo drivers were late, an hour, hour and a half. They didn't show up. So we had to get to the airport. And so we got, lim we got taxi cabs and everybody got in the taxi cabs and I piled the luggage in, piled the luggage in, and we went to the airport in taxi cabs. And so everybody got there and then, I call him Delman, but Artemis was not there. He lived in the area. So he was 25, 30, 45 minutes late with his entourage, which the little John engine was still, was running to keep wind blown and to keep electrical power on the plane, the little eight horsepower engine in the back.
they cut the big engines off with people walking around and getting on the plane because mm -hmm. you, you don't want the hippies getting their heads cut off. And so um, staggering into them big engines, you know, we, everybody got we got there. And so uh, when Artemis finally showed up, we 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 started to take off. We got in the plane. We we're leaving. And so as um, soon as the plane got up and we got fl flat, Ronnie came to me and he says, uh, man, I got to get some sleep. I took two sleeping pills. I'm going to be grogged out here just a minute. I got to get some sleep and I can't lay across these seats. I said, all right. Gary and Alan and Kevin Elson were sitting on the couch mm -hmm. that would seat four people right at the front of the plane. Across from them was two first class seats and a little table. Dean and Steve were sitting across from them. And in front of the couch was a two by six table mm -hmm. that ran down in front of the couch that you could put your feet on or you could have a drink or something and sit on the table. Mm -hmm. So I told Alan and Gary and Kevin, I said, put y'all's feet on the table. And Ronnie can lay down here under y'all's feet and he can sleep. Mm -hmm. and that way people can go to the galley and to the bathroom. And not disturb him. And not disturb him. Mm -hmm. so he, and I took his hand, put his head over his face. He's laying down there on the floor. Gone. I'm talking about out cold. And so the, it was a two and a half hour flight, two hour flight. So we were in the flight probably. When you, when you was like boarding on this plane after what happened, you know, before, like a few days before, did you feel like, did you have any feeling that something might go wrong? <coughs> well, yeah, but I was security, so I didn't have to. You, didn't, you just keep like yeah. calm. And I was listening to the other people. But what happened to get to that, that point is that that more uh, that that night which was that morning mm -hmm. whatever time it was in the morning wee 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 hours of the morning they were and so ronnie just had enough of it i mean he's had enough to drink and it was, it was his way to the highway he says you either get on the plane or you fire and so one of the few things that he did say uh, coherently was you know if it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And he told him to get on the plane because he was, but the road manager was talking in this ear going, hey, and what happened that morning is I got up early and I went to, the, to try to find the two pilots. Mm -hmm. And the girl at the desk said, oh, they're at the airport working on the plane. Mm -hmm. mm. So I take a taxi, I think, or a limousine, which, whatever. And I go to the airport and they're at the a cow half off a thing and they're working on the plane so as I get up and walk up then they they get down you know a step ladder a little step ladder and I said hey I said um, what are y'all doing well, well we're you, we just messing with it you know we've got a problem with the magneto and I said well we got a day off I said fix it right here now we're going to fly to, we're going to go fly to Baton Rouge and I said we don't need to fly to Baton Rouge. You got a problem with the engine? I said we f fix it right here. Mm -hmm. No, the mechanic flying to Baton Rouge, cheaper and easier for him to fly to Baton Rouge from Texas than from Texas to Greenville, South Carolina. Yes, and so um, I said, uh, I, I think you need to fix it here. We don't. Need, you know, I, I said this. We don't need to be doing this. Mm -hmm. So with the pilot, you know, he says, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, you don't have anything to do with this plane. So I'll snap my fingers and take you off of this plane. Make one phone call and you won't fly no more. I said, you're an idiot. I said, you need to fix it here. Mm -hmm. He says, you can say one more thing. I'll take you off of this plane. And so I um, turned around and I, I don't have it on me now, of course, a, a pistol, but I always got my knife. Mm -hmm. And so I turned around and took my knife out and I walked toward the plane. I was going to bust the tire so they couldn't fly. Well, the tire has a high pressure. Ooh, so as I walk up there, I'm not real smart, but as I walk up and I said, this has got so much pressure and it yeah. could blow my hands off or kill me or mess the tarmac up and I'm going to be sued or whatever, the band to be sued, whatever. So I turned around and I said, man, like he said, don't say nothing else to me. He said, I know what I'm doing. 
He says, I'll take you off this plane. I said, you're a fool. And I walked off in, in the air when we were having that problem. And I run back and forth up there. And I told him, I, you know, the engine's running out of fuel and spinning the plane sideways. And, and they said, well, get everybody strapped in. We're going to have a, make a belly landing. And so everybody, and I run by Ronnie, I kicked him. I kicked him in the ribs. Get up. You know, and I went back up to the cockpit again. I said, you know, I cussed him out. I said, Dad, don't you wish you was on the, like, I, and, and, and you just make sure everybody's strapped in and thing. We're going to make this belly landing. And they have talked to Houston about, Houston told them to turn around and go back to Macomb. Oh, there's no way. And so when they first started talking, the little John engine was still running. They had flap control. Mm -hmm. So one time they tried to figure out why they didn't have no fuel. They, they little John engine had ran out. So they couldn't turn the plane. It was just like it's that. Right and so everybody was strapped in. I kicked Ronnie and I run up to the cockpit. And then I saw that we wasn't going to make the field. We were going to be a quarter of a mile short. So I knew that we weren't going to make it. And I cussed him out. And I said, see, now we're not going to make it. You know, and I said, now what you've done, what you've done. And the last thing they heard was me telling them, don't you wish you was on the tarmac like I begged you to do. And then I run and grab Ronnie up on the floor because I knew we wasn't going to make it. And he was so grogged down. He thought I was the one that basically took he, he, he had no idea. He had no idea what was going on. I said, man, get up. The plane's crashing. And he, I got him up here, you know. Don't be messing with me. Man, I got to get some sleep. Don't be messing around, Gene. He's trying to break loose. Mm -hmm. And I pushed him between. And I said, man, I'm not, I'm not joking. And I grabbed the seatbelt. I put the seatbelt together. I picked up the, the, the pillow. There was little throw pillows, mm -hmm. three or four of them on them. I picked up, put your head down, man. That, he took it, don't be mad. And he thought I was, he was ready to fight. And so I slapped him. I said, I'm not joking. Put your head down, man. Put your head down like that. And I pushed his head down. And I know, somebody said trees. I started hitting the trees. So I turned to run to my seat, but I was running uphill because we were coming down at a 52 degree angle. And so um, I know he unsnapped the seatbelt. If he hadn't unsnapped the seatbelt, he'd still be alive. Oh, that's, that's a horror story there. That's, that's a that's really hard. I mean, but do you remember the moment? Did you wake up being in the forest somewhere in Mississippi or No, I was it was a couple of weeks later before I started getting because I had a massive head injury, a big hole in my head and um no, I didn't if I did wake up, I'm sure that I was because Billy Powell said once I crawled out under the wing uh, nobody knew I was there, and they set him on the wing, part of the wing, and he said, you crawled up up under there, and you was bloody and black stuff all over you and everything, and reaching for me and passing out. And so I, I was unconscious, and I stayed that way. Um, the whole week I was in Mississippi for a, a couple of weeks until I started coming down off the drugs. and. Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't, I've, I've talked to people, so I know the, all the stories, and I know what, what happened, what, what went on, but I was out of it. I was unconscious. How was your recovery? Where did you recover? Well, let me go back. Um, when the responders and the rescuers got us out of the the crash and there's a lunatic out there saying he was involved in it which he wasn't um national guard helicopters had came in because to to, to secure the perimeter a lot, uh, some of the people that wasn't hurt very bad or at all went to the little local hospital and all of a sudden it was swamped and so they took some of us to Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Alan, me, I think Gary, maybe Leslie. Because you were basically badly injured. Yeah, right? we were. Uh, um, some of us were a lot more injured than most of the people yeah, that was... didn't get injured at all, actually. Some of them. Um, I was taken to Jackson, and for some reason, I guess they thought that the big hole in my head that I was actually 
you know, brain dead. You know, because I was brain dead before the plane crash. You know, because I was, you know, third grade, <laughs> third grade education. I was brain dead before the plane crash. But um, <laughs> um, I went to Jackson, and Alan was there in the same hospital. But, but for, I think he was below me. And so um, I was there about a week. My ex-wife and my girlfriend were there. Hello. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the band flew my ex-wife out and my girlfriend and her mother drove out. Mm -hmm. They, I, I don't know how to have them, but they were trying to get me back to Florida for plastic surgery and some work. And so the people in Mississippi, I don't guess they even done any x-rays. So um, my ex-wife and my girlfriend, they, they, they had, the, the plane had been arranged so the first class seats were down and they could put the stretcher mm -hmm. in the first class section. So leaving the hospital, my ex-wife and my girlfriend, they said, Look at these red streaks going up his arm. You know, y'all need to do something. They hadn't even, <laughs> they hadn't even washed my injuries, and this eye was melted, fried, and so um, they came in with some beta dye, and I find out, and they washed the burnt areas in my head and everything, and I had a big hole burnt inside of my face over here, and this this eye was fr melted. And I had a big hole in it. Anyway, so um, they fly me to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And so um, plastic surgeon doctors and other doctors kind of met me coming into the emergency room. And it says, get him to the ER, OR right now. And so I got to cut all this out. So anyway, I'm out, of course. And he takes and cuts all these burn areas out and takes some hide off my leg mm -hmm. and patches up these places. Who tell me that if they hadn't have washed my arm with that beta dine, when they did the two hour flight, he'd had to cut my arm off right here because gangrene, gangrea had set in. Yeah. And why they didn't wash those injuries a week earlier, you know, and, and my head. So he patched all that up and did a lot of plastic surgery and, you know, my face and had a partial facelift on this side. Still ugly, but I had a facelift. And um, he skin grafted all these places. And I wore a burn mask and a burn sleeve. I was the first person in Florida to wear the new Job's pressure garments. Oh. And it covered my f head and, and left my face open. And a couple of times going in the bank, people see me going in the bank from the back side with this mask on, they call the police. This guy, the bank's being robbed. This guy's robbing the bank, he's got a mask on. You, know, you shouldn't be like, people, he, relax. I work for NASA, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm in there trying to cash a check or whatever, and the cop's coming in and over. It's just you, you know? So finally, the, the second time. Oh, the usual. <laughs> the second time, they had just, this is when, this is kind of funny. They had just came out with, what's the ATM now, but back then it was called a Tilly, mm -hmm. Tilly machine. They put one on the corner of Cass, uh, uh, San Juan Avenue and whatever, Florida National Bank on the corner. And I went to the bank one day to cash a check and there was a long line inside. Mm -hmm. They had just put the Tilly machine outside. And I went, I got this card, I'll go out to the t AT machine and try this Tilly card. Mm -hmm. and I went out there, you know, and I put the card in, you know, and somebody had seen me go in the bank and they called the police and said, there's a guy robbing the bank. And I came out and I went out to the Tilly machine and then the cops all run to the bank, you know, and I knew one of them was a very good friend of mine, Doyle Hollingsworth, so and a friend, friend of the band. And he came out and, and I opened the door to Tilly machine. I went, I'm looking for me. <laughs> and Doyle comes over and says, man, he said, Gene, these guys are new out of rookies out of, out of the police academy. He said, they allow them to shoot you before they know what's going on. I went, he said, yeah. So I talked to my doctor and told him what was going on. He said, well, you're doing so good. Just take the mask off during the day mm -hmm. and wear it at nighttime when you sleep. And I did, and it turned, it, it made all the skin real soft. And actually he had 
doctors from all over the country mm -hmm. come into the hospital and see what the Job's pressure garments were doing. So it, they started doing real good for burn patients. And so I mean, you look pretty good. I wouldn't even ever tell that you had like any burns in your face or your arm. Well, they got suntan, but yeah, there's you can if you look, you see where they cut the bad skin out, you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, like I said, after he patched this up after 18 months, when the scarring stopped, he cut that out and tightened all that up. You can't see it. If you look at my ear, you'll see a scar goes around my ear. You didn't know that Ronnie was dead, right? No. At the beginning. They didn't tell me for a month. How did you find out about it? Who told you? Well, I was uh, I was in the hospital almost a month, and um, getting out of the hospital, I wanted to go see Ronnie. I said, "Let's go by Ronnie's house. I'll see Ronnie." And my girlfriend was driving, and she says, "Yeah, all right, we'll go see Ronnie." And we're driving, like we're going out to his on Blanding Boulevard. We're going out to Orange Park. We're going that way, you know. And she turns into the cemetery and pulls down there. He was in a temporary mausoleum mm -hmm. area. And I said, what are, you, what are we doing here? She said, I'm taking you to visit Ronnie. He didn't make it. Oh man, that was horrible. That was brutal that, that day. I mean, yeah, probably for you it was the worst because you know, everybody else who survived the crash, they already knew. So they survived that period of yeah. sadness and sorrow versus you, like, I mean. Ugh. Yeah, they didn't tell me that he or Steve, Dean, Cassie passed away. Ugh. Yeah, until I pulled up there to the mausoleum. And I went, what the world? And how was your life after the crash? Did you have like any, you know, flashbacks? Like people, for example, who went to Vietnam, you know, they had, they get in those Vietnamese flashbacks. Do you um, have anything like that? Yeah, not, not really bad flashbacks, but just post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, you're thinking about it and, uh, every day and then, for, you know, for, for a long time, I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't talk like I'm doing now because it was, okay. you know, still, it's rough, Fresh. you know, but you deal with it, you know. And uh, you wrote a book. I wrote a couple of books. Yeah, but the one that I'm referring to right now is uh, I'll Never Forget You. Well, I was in the hospital. They told me with such a massive head injury. Uh, first, when they did tests and stuff, they found out that it was motor skills, you know, and they said it could be in the memory section, but you do have some damage. Mm -hmm. And um, so probably memory section, they're right. But anyway, um, I started writing things down, you know, started writing stuff, you know, that I could remember that I didn't want to lose. And I've lost some of that stuff. And I started writing this stuff down and I started and some girls I had met on the road knew that I was doing writing and they said, why don't you turn it into a book? I said, well, I'm not a writer, I don't have an education. They said, well, you, you know, you can do it, you can do it. So uh, in 83, when Alan Collins put the Alan Collins band together, he wanted me to do his merchandising and security for him. So I finished it, put it together and published it myself and um, it was still on them with Alan Collins' band, but he didn't put but four or five shows together. Uh, I mean, he didn't do but four or five shows before he broke that band up. He didn't like the singer. Mm -hmm. The singer would pass out cold from two beers. Alan said, nah, he said, nah, he's gonna mess with music up and so he's some put a stop to it. Mm -hmm. I'll get another singer. And we had a couple of singers lined up but then he got paralyzed in a car wreck and that was the end of that. But that's how I did my first book. Did you feel better when you were writing everything, you know, basically on, pa on paper? Yeah, you can, see, you, can see, you can see what you're writing mm -hmm. and you can see your thoughts and put them down. And it's, 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 if I could type or all that stuff, it would be different, but handwriting everything, it made it easier. You know, and I, I, I did put a lot of stuff together. I, some stuff I didn't put in the book. 
and uh, I was really except I did a lot of poetry in the hospital mm -hmm. when I got out and I put some of those things in there mm -hmm. uh, in my book quite a few poems might be one two five, about five or six maybe that's great and then what can you tell to someone who's struggling right now who may be going through recovery what can like what's some advice you can give to those people you have to deal with it you know you have to stick your chin up your chest out you know and um every day gets better every day you just have to you just have to deal with it like i can't tell you that it's how to get rid of it because it won't it don't never leave you just gotta you just gotta put it in the in the computer so it's it's going to be there automatically you just put it there so it's not so easy to come out you have to search for it you know and um It'll be with you forever, you know. And sometimes, if you're feeling great and everything's doing good and everything's going along fine, you don't think about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, just you know, you, when things ain't just so basically good, basically live with it. And yeah. Don't give up. Just so, do whatever you can. You know, sometimes when the nights are long, or days are long, or something else gets on your mind and stuff like that, or you you hear a song, you, just, you hear people talk about it, like on the computer. He's got so many fans. He left so many fans that, and people always ask. That's why I dealt with. He gets with new fans, so. Yeah, that's why I dealt with Facebook because when I first got on there, people were always asking me about you know, tell them some stories about Ronnie and Alan, you know, and uh, the rest of them, and what was it like? And everybody's it, those fans are inquisitive. They want to know. Some of them are really hardcore. I mean, sometimes you got some fans. You got fanatics, and you got people that are just it brought their life together. And there's people I talk to that say, "Man, Ronnie saved my life. His music brought me out of the worst time of my life." You know, and they're not talking to me; they're talking to Ronnie through me. Going, you know, and it, it's it's a it, it's touching. To have people say that, man, I would have never lived through what I went through without Ronnie's music, without Ronnie Van Zandt, you know. And so, I can transmit to them what he probably would say or talk, you know. So that that's a little that's bit to me. That's um, it's it's touching. And then, if Ronnie was here right now like he would walk in through that door you know wearing his hat and everything what would be the first thing that he would tell him well if he walked through that door that means that we wouldn't have had the airplane crash you know he would still be alive things would be dramatically different if he walked through the door now um, I'd just say I, you know, I miss you you know and you can, I can see him. I can see him standing at that door since you brought that up. I can look there because I picture him all my life, all his life, us growing up. I know what he looked like as a little boy. I know what he looked like at 10 years old. I know what he looked like at 15 years old. I knew what he looked like at 29 years old. With the hat, without the hat, fishing or driving around that Mustang. I can picture him anywhere.